Anyways, um, the first few seasons that I did this for you guys, I almost had full heart attacks. Um, I remember that quote, I don't know if you guys know this from Jerry Seinfeld, where he said, like, the number one fear is um, public speaking, and the number two fear is death. So people would rather be in the casket than delivering the eulogy. That was me. Like, <laughs> I was so afraid of doing this. And um, I, I hate the dentist, actually. And one morning, my husband was on his way to the dentist, and I was on my way here to do this. And I was like, I'm so jealous of you right now. <laughs> I would so much rather be at the dentist. Um, I had so much fear. I would lose sleep. I would be always consumed with the thought of, of, am I gonna look stupid? Am I gonna sound stupid? Am I gonna fall off the stage or on the stage or knock over the whiteboard? Remember when I did that? <laughs> I had, had gone through every scenario in my mind of what possibly could happen and I was so afraid. Human beings are so fearful, aren't they? I'm a psych nurse. And so I know that people have like fear and anxiety that's crippling beyond the point of like needing mental health and physical intervention. So don't hear me saying something simplistic or ignorant here. There may be some people who need actual intervention for their anxiety, but that's not exactly the kind of fear that I'm talking about today. I'm talking about the fear that most of us face every day. So like fear of the future, Fear of um, what's going to happen to my kids. Um, are they going to be saved? Are they going to be safe? Um, fear of our finances. Can I afford this? What does this month look like? Fear for our families and for their safety. Think of it for a minute, you guys. When you're in bed at night and it's dark and you can't sleep, where does your mind go? Where does it start to circle, right? Like you are afraid of things all the time. And, I mean, that's not to mention fear of public speaking, fear of flying or heights or the dark, fear of intimacy, fear of dying, fear of failure, fear of rejection, loneliness, spiders. Remember my video? We have familiar, fear of commitment, fear of the unknown, fear of missing out. Uh, not to mention all the phobias and irrational fears that we develop. You name it, humans are afraid of it. We all have felt it, right? That racing heart rate, panicky, nausea feeling, sweating, ringing in the ears, head spinning, physical response to fear. We all get that. It's necessary, actually. It's a necessary human emotion. Now, my cat, Eddie, he's fearless. And that's definitely not good at all. The other night, um, my dog was barking at the fence with another dog. It was a violent, large dog barking. Um, scenario and we open the door to call the dog and the cat goes barreling out in the middle of these large dogs and starts hissing at them. <laughs> like this fearless, stupid cat could have actually gotten killed. So, you know, sometimes fear is very good and very necessary and God made us this way. We're made to fear. So, and it was normal even for the Apostle Paul. Can you even imagine this brave, courageous defender of the faith? Afraid. He had been through so much, right? He'd been scoffed at and tortured and dragged before councils and stood up for the gospel time and time again. And we see him this short time later. And he's, despite many people coming to the faith, many good things happening in his world, he seems to be at the point or some commentators believe that he was thinking of giving up. So that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at Acts chapter 18, the first 11 verses, so you can get that ready. And we're going to sli show slide one first, because the first line says, after these things, he left Athens and went to Corinth. Maybe it's slide two, actually. Yeah. Oh, you guys, see, I can't see. You're showing it already. Okay, so after these things, he left Athens and went to Corinth. The population of that city at the time was about 750,000 people, and it was a fairly new-ish city. No building was more than 100 years old at the time. It was a Roman colony and was flourishing 
It, had, uh, it was a flourishing center of political power, commerce, and sexual immorality. It had location, location, location going for it. And as you can see on the map, it had um, north-south land routes, and they intersected with east-west sea routes. And it had two ports, right? So one on the east, um, open to the Aegean Sea, and the other one on the west, open to the Adriatic Sea. And as in many port cities, Corinth was especially known for sexual promiscuity. Picture modern-day Vegas. In fact, a well-known sentiment for the people was to live like a Corinthian, and that meant to live immorally. Maybe they said things like, what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. Uh, it was particularly, particularly immoral. You like that, Christina? It's funny. That's a good one. Um, <laughs> I like to hear somebody laughing once in a while. <laughs> it was particularly immoral and maybe the worst that Paul had ever seen. So the temple of Aphrodite, known as the goddess of love, was at their city center and it stood on a hill 1,900 feet high and it was overlooking the city. So they could look up any time and see this great big temple. It had thousands of female slave prostitutes that would relate, re walk all around the, t the city looking for worshipers. Okay, so let's, we know, we, we, know, we know where we are now. Let's read our text, and we're going to read the first 11 verses. After these things, he left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, he came to them. And because he was with the same trade, he stayed with them. And they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. And he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your heads. I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. Then he left there, went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God, whose house was next to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. And the Lord sent to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid any longer. But go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. And he settled there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. This is the word of the Lord. When Paul wrote his letters to the Corinthians after his initial visit, he shed some light on what he was going through at this time when he entered the city of Corinth. From 1 Corinthians 2, 1 to 3, he says, when I came to you, brothers and sisters, announcing the mystery of God to you, I did not come with brilliance or speech or wisdom. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. Paul doesn't exactly tell us what it was here in Corinth that made him weak and fearful. And it seems confusing to us because we look at verse 8, and it says that many were believing and being baptized. So despite the success he was having for the kingdom, he was fearful and weak. This state that he's in reminds me of Elijah. Remember Elijah in 1 Kings, you guys? He just had this face-to-face -face matchup on Mount Carmel against all the prophets of Baal, where they needed to prove their God. And um, he alone represented God, and there were 450 prophets of Baal. No matter what the people did to call Baal, um, there would obviously be no fire. But then when Elijah gathered the people, made an altar with an ox on it, and even poured water all over the altar, he prayed to God and the fire consumed the offering right away, and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up all the water. Almighty God's power is proven on that mountain, and Elijah wins the greatest of victory of all time, and all the prophets of Baal are killed. And that chapter even ends with Elijah physically outrunning a chariot all the way to Jezreel. Physically outran it for 14 miles. So what a victory Elijah has just been through. Two days later, we find him under a tree, 
depressed, and suicidal. He thinks he's all alone, and there's no believers in God left. And it's at that point that God intervenes in a very similar way that he intervenes here for Paul. He intervenes with the promise to Elijah that he is not alone, and that God has a remnant in Israel of 7,000 that have not bowed to, bowed to Baal. At Elijah's low point, God intervenes with a promise. So Paul is at a similar low point here. We aren't totally told why. I wonder if it could have been all the sin and the immorality around him um, and the idolatry could have affected him. Corinthians were also like really smart and they'd hold these conferences of all the famous orators would come and talk about um, how, to, how to advance socially. And so maybe he was intimidated by some of the, the knowledge and um, the intellect around him. Maybe the journey was wearing on him. You know, he just, maybe it just was a lot to be struggling with beaten and, and, and put in prison and, and persecution and trials and all that was starting to have an emotional toll on him. Whatever the reason is, didn't we just love learning that the Apostle Paul is human and that he had this fear as well? Even in the successful time of kingdom work being flourishing, even he struggled with human weakness and fear. So we get to verse 9 at this point. This beautiful promise delivered right when Paul needed it, similar to the promise that God gave Elijah. Let's put it up on slide three. Oh, look how smart you are. Um, and the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. So God didn't scold him or punish him, or he knows that we're naturally afraid. Instead, he told him what to do, and he gave him clear instructions. He assured him of his safety, and he reminded him of his remnant. This promise for Paul in Corinth at 52 AD is also a promise for us. And we're going to spend the rest of today looking at this promise. So the first line of the promise is, do not be afraid any longer. That's slide four. Notice how God doesn't scorn him or punish him for being afraid. God seems to know that Paul had been afraid for some time. Because he says not to be afraid any longer. Have you been afraid for some time? Do you feel weak and trembling? I know I do, like quite often. Do you look at the circumstances around you, your family, your finances, your husband, your kids, your health, the consequences of your own actions? Do these things kind of freak you out? Are you frozen, isolating, and alone? Have you been feeling that nauseous butterfly feeling in your stomach for so long that it's just become a part of you? God says, do not be afraid any longer. He doesn't say, don't be afraid ever. So you've been afraid, but stop it now. If you were made like this and made to fear, then what can we do about it? You were born with an innate human emotion to fear. You can't help it. What you can help, though, is what you choose to fear. The Bible tells us to transfer our fear. Transfer it. Transfer it over to God. The Bible tells us over 360 times not to be afraid. And over 300 times it tells us to fear the Lord. From Psalm 56 it says, When I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I will not fear. What can mere mortals do to me? This I know, God is for me. In God whose word I praise, in God I trust. I will not be afraid. What can mere humans do to me? Have you been afraid of mere mortals for too long? I know I have. Stop it. <laughs> Fear God. Trust God. God loves his people. We can trust him. We have no reason to fear mere mortals. It's easy to say, don't fear, but it's hard to do. So let's make a plan. Find the promises of God in your Bible and highlight them, your preceptors. 
I like to mark mine with a rainbow in the margin of my Bible. You can make a list of them. You can write them in your journal. You can make a list of the characters of God. You can pray through the promises. You can preach them to yourself, talk to God about them. You can worship and praise him, which is the best reorienting of all. If you're struggling with fearing mere mortals, make a plan to actively stop. Actively transfer your fear to God. Or you could do like me, and my family would strongly advise against it, but you can make a little jingle. Okay, are you ready? Fear God, not man, fear God, not man, and he'll keep you safe in the lion's den. <laughs> right? I mean, it's no Stephanie Redekop, but I'm sure she's going to want all the lyrics to that one, right? And actually, that's all of the lyrics, so. <laughs> I mean, it's silly, but you wouldn't believe how much that little jingle comes into play, and it's just like a nothing moment, but I'm just like, start singing the song, right? So... Anyways, it's a little reminder for me and my little family to put our eyes to the Lord, to lift our eyes up to the hill and remember who he is. All right, slide five. Go on speaking. God tells Paul to, what to do instead of fearing. And what to do is to go on speaking and do not be silent. God is telling him, keep doing what I sent you to do. Keep sharing the gospel. Keep proclaiming the truth about Jesus to the people. Keep obeying me. God told him to speak because God had a plan, and what he was doing in that city wasn't about Paul. It was fulfilling God's will. Remember my story about how anxious I was and sharing lessons with you all? Well, I had to learn that it wasn't about me, right? It's not about me, and it's not about you. Let's get our eyes off of ourselves and on to what God's will is and his purpose for every situation that we're faced with. God delights to use the weak to accomplish his purposes and to magnify himself. Are you weak? Good. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, Jesus said to Paul, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. And Paul said, I will boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. I read this morning, God um, pitches his tent in your weakness. Love that, right? Just gave me a visual. When was the last time that we boasted in our weaknesses? Maybe even as we learned last week, thanked him for them. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's all about God and his plan and about furthering his kingdom. Our advice from God here in combating fear is go on speaking about the gospel. Go on obeying him. Paul went on in 1 Corinthians 10.31 to write, Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And Matthew 10.19 says, reminds us, don't worry about what you will say or how you will say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. It's not about us. Go on speaking and do not be silent about the truth. Remember the mission from Acts 1 verse 8? That's still the mission. All right, slide six. I am with you. So here's the promise. Jesus promised to never leave or forsake you. Matthew 28, 20. He promises to be with us even to the end of the age. In the beginning of Acts, he sent his spirit to be with you, to help us, to lead us, guide us, work in and through us. No wonder we shouldn't be afraid of mere mortals. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy uh, 2 verse 7 that we have not been given a spirit of power, of fear, but of power and love and self-control. The very spirit we have working in us is one of power and love and self-control, not fear. This guarantee of God's presence is a common thread throughout the Bible, right? We've heard it many times before. God was with Israel when they moved through the wilderness, a cloud and a pillar. 
Psalm 46 says about God and Israel, God is in her midst. She will not be moved. God is in our midst. He pitches a tent in our weakness. Zephaniah 3 tells us to rejoice and exult with all our heart because God is in our midst. Fear disaster no more, for he is singing over you with joy. He sings over you. Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. He is our refuge. A personal favorite psalm of mine, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, from Psalm 91, will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. His shadow is enough for our protection. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, for it is he who delivers you from the snare and the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you may see refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. This is the promise if you make him your refuge. Isaiah 41.10, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Jesus already conquered death for you. His death and re resurrection already did it all. You abide in him, and he abides in you. His death and resurrection completed it. When he died for you, he won every battle for you. He conquered every fear for you. You have nothing to fear. Therefore, as Hebrews 4.15 tells us, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And from Deuteronomy, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. It is a promise he's made for some time, starting in Deuteronomy, right, all the way to now. Um, next slide, you are not alone. God said to Paul, go on speaking to the people of Corinth, because he had made many people in the city. To this, Paul didn't say, well, since you have many people here, I'll just move on, I guess we're done. No, Paul accepted this to mean that some people in Corinth were still going to be saved when he preached the word to them. The Lord was letting Paul know that some people in Corinth belonged to Jesus even though they didn't know it yet. Paul needed to continue to preach the gospel because Jesus was determined to have more people in that city. Now we might be tempted to think, well, I wish I had a promise like that when it came to sharing Jesus. Well, take heart because you do. Maybe there are some people in your life who belong to Jesus, but don't know it yet. Isn't that a sobering, exciting, and challenging thought? Maybe it's your hairdresser, your coworker, your neighbor, fellow soccer mom. You have a circle of people around you. Undoubtedly, there are some of them who are his and don't know it yet. Let's go find them, right? Let's lean in, make trusting relationships with them, start gospel conversations, being brave to go there. And let's find out. Let's speak true and beautiful things about our Lord and find his people. Remember the remnant that God told Elijah about? He said, I will leave 7,000 people in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. For when we look around, we see there's a remnant, right? There's a remnant we already know are here. All the saints that have gone before you, all of your sisters that are sitting beside you, you are not alone. Don't forget it. And maybe this is why we need to get together together so that we don't forget it. Don't isolate. Be with your people. Remind each other you're not the only ones. We need that reminding. I've had to do some ugly, harder things lately, and knowing that I had sisters praying for me and cheering me on in the background that I was going to be able to tell my story to later it made me feel stronger. It made me feel more courageous at the time. Remember last year when we studied the minor prophets, like Zephaniah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and those books, we learned throughout those books that God has a remnant. We marked the word remnant, remember? 
we learned an overarching theme that God was coming to judge the wicked nations, but the hope was that God would keep a remnant and show mercy to her and reverse her judgment because he is good and he keeps his promises. So God has not forgotten his remnant and we should not either.